Hello again, board gamers. This video is going to be a review of Mission Red Planet, a very interactive and fun game of area control for 2 to 6 players. We'll go through the rules before the review, and I'll do a short comparison at the end with the new version of Libertalia. So let's get right into it. Mission Red Planet takes place in the era where humans can travel to Mars. And just very recently, rovers on Mars have found potential mining sites of new minerals that do not exist on Earth. You, as the head of a mining corporation, recognize this as a huge opportunity and try to claim these mining sites ASAP by hiring astronauts to go to Mars. But of course, you are not the only person with this idea. In Mission Red Planet, your goal is to have the most points at the end of 10 rounds. There are two major ways to get points, either by collecting these resource tokens, which literally has the number of points printed on them, or by completing end-game mission cards, which could be a global or a personal one. Let's talk about these resources first. There are two boards set up in a game to represent Mars and its satellite Phobos. Altogether, a total of 10 different mining sites are available, where each area produces one of the three resources. This information is hidden until an astronaut enters the corresponding area. You will not instantly get resources when you place your astronauts in one of these areas. Instead, the resources only quote-unquote spawn during these three production phases. You'll see these production phase symbols occasionally instead of numbers. When the game has advanced to those time points, each area will produce their indicated resources. The first production phase will spawn one resource token on each area. During the second and third production phase, however, it will produce two and three tokens respectively instead. If during this production phase only your astronauts are in that area, then you simply receive all the resources produced in that same area. But if other players' astronauts are also there, then the player with the majority astronaut count will receive all the resources instead. In the case of a tie, each player will get the same number of tokens, leaving the rest in that area for the next production phase. If there's only one token during the tie, well then no one gets it. This area control mechanism is the central part of the game, and you'll be basically fighting everyone over resources this way all game. At this point, you are probably wondering why anyone would bother with this one point resource when you can get the two or three point ones instead. The answer to that is this global mission that appears appears every game. Basically, the person with the most ice tokens at the end of the game will get extra 9 points. So, you now know that placing astronauts on Mars is crucial to get you points. But how do you get them there in the first place? Well, that's where these ships and character cards come in. Every round, a number of these ships will be made available depending on player count. Each ship will tell you its capacity and destination. For example, this ship right here can fit up to 3 astronauts and it's going to Hellas. You can tell where Hellas is immediately as the ship card itself has highlighted the area on the map of Mars. When a ship is docked on this platform, any astronauts are free to board the ship. Once a ship is full, however, it will automatically launch and is considered undocked. The only way for you to put your astronauts in these ships is by playing one of these character cards. Each player starts the game with the same hand of 9 character cards. All 9 cards will let you put a number of astronauts into those docked ships plus a unique effect on top. At the start of each non-production round, each player will simultaneously pick one of these cards to play for that round. So let's quickly go through them starting with card number 1. Number 1 or the pilot lets you place 2 total astronauts in one or two dock ships. So it can either be one astronaut in two ships or two astronauts in one ship. In addition, it allows you to change the destination of any one ship including the ones that have been launched. Moving on, the soldier or number two lets you only place one astronaut but it allows you to kill one other astronaut on Phobos or outer zone of Mars. Yes, kill is literally the word they use on this card. None of those weak nonsense like defeat or knocked out. No, 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 no. These astronauts will die. In fact, they even have this little board dedicated to dead astronauts. The lost in space memory or hell as I like to call it, is going to look more like this towards the end of the game. Yes, this is that kind of game. Anyways, after you had yeeted one of the astronauts from Mars, the soldier also lets you move up to three of your astronauts from Phobos to any zone on Mars. This is the only way you can move astronauts from Phobos to Mars. Moving forward, we have the travel agent or number three that lets you place exactly three astronauts in one ship. If none of the ships can fit all three of your astronauts, well, then this card does nothing. Up next, femme fatale or number four lets you place only one astronaut, but allows you to quote-unquote charm an opponent's astronaut located in the same ship or area as one of your own astronauts. Charming an astronaut means you'll replace it with one of your own. Then we have Saboteur or number 5 that also lets you only place one astronaut but it allows you to destroy one docked ship killing everyone in it. Secret Agent or number 6 lets you place two astronauts but you must place them in two different ships. Then you have to force one of the ships to launch even if it's not full. Scientist or number 7 lets you place two astronauts in one or two docked ships and allows you to draw one event card. An event card that you draw can either be a mission, discovery, or action card. Mission cards are your personal goals that give you points when you achieve them at the end of the game. For example, this mission card will give you points depending on where your astronauts are on the board. The card will show you which areas on Mars will score if it contains at least one of your own astronauts. In this case, only these four areas are relevant to this mission. So if your astronauts are scattered this way at the end of the game, using the score chart, you will get two points from this mission as you only fulfilled the conditions for two areas. Now, if it were to look like this instead, 
this would have been a 7-pointer because all 4 relevant areas contain your astronauts. And yes, personal mission cards will be the final major source of points that I mentioned earlier. Everyone starts with one mission card and the only way to get more of them is by using the scientist. However, there's a good chance that you'll get a discovery card instead. Discovery cards add an endgame surprise to the outer areas of Mars. Unlike missions, you don't ever keep the discovery cards that you get. Instead, you'll be pacing it face down under one of the outer areas of Mars like so. Once the game has reached this stage, all discovery cards will be revealed, applying the card's effect to the area above it. Just like mission cards, there is a variety of discovery cards that you can get. They can either have beneficial or detrimental effects, which can be situational and sometimes would also directly affect your endgame points. Consider this scenario as an example. It is the end of round 10, and you can clearly tell that green is about to get the 3 resource tokens from the upcoming production phase. However, as we chronologically must advance to this reveal discovery phase first, the discovery card underneath the area will be applied before the production phase. The card says, quote, If only one player has the most astronauts in this zone, the player with the second most astronauts receives the point tokens instead. End quote. As the discovery card had basically taken out the majority player, blue will then get the resources instead. Note that each area can only have one discovery card, and each card will show you when its effect will activate. The activation timing is important, as someone might have one of these action cards. Action cards are very much like discovery cards, but instead of it blindly affecting everyone in an area, action cards will only benefit the owner, as you keep them secret in your hand just like a mission card. There are only 4 action cards in the event deck, each having its own activation period just like the discoveries. I'll put a TLDR on screen in case you wanna know what each of them does. Back to our scientist, if you don't want to draw an event card, you can optionally take a peek at one of the discoveries. Up next, we have the Explorer or number 8, which only lets you place one astronaut but gives you 3 movement points. You immediately use these points to move your astronauts to an adjacent area in Mars. For example, this astronaut can move to these 3 adjacent areas. Areas are defined as adjacent to another area when they share a common border. Utilizing the 3 movement points from the Explorer, a single move like so will consume one of them. You can spend these points anyhow you want. For example, you can move one astronaut 3 spaces away, or instead move 3 astronauts 1 space away. Moving on to the last character card, we have the Recruiter or number 9. The Recruiter only lets you place one astronaut but returns all your character cards to your hand. You see, all the characters that you have played will be placed on the table face up for everyone to see. You cannot use these cards again unless you return them to your hand using the Recruiter's effect. Once everyone has secretly chosen one of the character cards, the first player will then do a countdown from 9 to 1. So yes, you would literally go 9, 8, 7, and so on just like a space launch countdown. When your chosen character card's number is called out, you reveal your card and perform all of its actions. Once it's all done, the countdown then continues and this keeps going until everyone has used their card's actions. If you choose the same card as someone else, the first player of that round will have the highest priority, followed by the other players in clockwise order. After everyone has played their cards, all the undocked ships will then go to their destination areas in Mars or Phobos, dropping off all the astronauts in the ship on that same area. The remaining dock ships and astronauts will carry over to the next round, while the empty docks will be refilled with new ships from the deck. As this marks the end of the round, the round tracker is progressed once and is given to the player that performed the last character action, making them the new first player for the next round. Here's a quick recap because I basically explained the rules in reverse. 1. At the start of a round, everyone secretly picks one character card, then the first player will start the countdown from 9 to 1. 2. Play your chosen card when it's called out. When everyone has done step 2, step 3 is to move all astronauts from the launch ships to their destination. 4. Refill the ships and pass the first player to the new eligible player. This ends that round. If the next round is a numbered round, repeat steps 1 to 4. If it is one of the production rounds instead, distribute resource tokens following the majority rule. As you play through the rounds, you will eventually reach the end game, denoted by this reveal discovery round where you simply flip up all the discovery cards under Mars. From this point onwards, action and discovery card effects will trigger during their activation periods. The third production phase right after follows the same majority rules but will most likely be a affected by discoveries or actions. And just after the third production phase, we finally reach the scoring phase, where you add points from your resources, completed missions, maybe some discoveries, and an extra 9 points if you have the most ice tokens. Whoever has got the most points is the winner of the game. So how good or bad is Mission Red Planet? Let's start with the good things first. Three great things immediately springs to mind. Fast, fun, and surprisingly thinky. A 6 player game of Mission Red Planet will realistically last just above an hour, thanks to the simultaneous nature of the action selection. 
removing or adding players in the game doesn't really affect the playtime much as the game's minimal downtime makes it scale well with any player count. That being said, don't even bother playing this game with just two because they'll want you to play not one but two dummy players which is just ridiculous because the fun factor of the game comes mostly from the constant player interaction. You will always be on the lookout for what other players might do as their moves can and will impact your situation. The constant tension from other players is great and makes this more of a social game than a Euro. Though the game isn't exactly like a party game because it has a pretty good strategic depth to it. In fact, the game can be quite open-ended because there is a pretty big decision space in the game and it's not that easy to figure out what the best moves are. Yes, the mission card does give you a general guide but you would want to do other things in conjunction to get the most points. While all of that sounds great in theory, the strategic part of the game can unfortunately be overshadowed by its chaotic nature. This is especially pronounced in higher player counts like 5 or 6 players as there are even more unknown player choices that can drastically affect your plans. Whether this is good or bad truly depends on your preference in games. As I have mentioned, I find this to be the actual fun part of the game, likely because I treat it more as a party game of sorts. As long as you don't take this game too seriously, I really think you will find it quite enjoyable. Aside from being chaotic, for a game that's on the simpler side, there is quite a bit to teach before you even start. Granted, I did deliberately choose to explain every single one of the characters because I feel like it's important to teach or at least point out some of the mechanics which are unique to the characters. But at that point, I might as well just explain them all. Plus, if I actually didn't, chances are people will ask about them anyway after reading those cards. And speaking of reading, why is there so much text in this game? Almost every single one of the character cards, including some of the event cards, contains a wall of text. It can be a bit of a rude surprise when you're all excited to draw event cards just to be greeted with that. I mean, honestly, this one barely even fits the card. I think that adding some symbols or icons could improve the game's wordiness at least a bit. In comparison, if you see Lost Runes of our next cards, yes, they are quite wordy, but they evidently try to use symbols here and there. So I can't see why this game can't do something similar. To be fair, the cards will be in your hand, so you don't have to squint at the table to read them all the time. Okay, now it's time to compare Mission Red Planet to Libertalia. So why Libertalia? Well, the game has a similar character card mechanic where each player simultaneously chooses one card and have them played in numerical order. The game is also pretty chaotic, packed full of direct player interactions and can fit up to 6 players. So far, it's basically identical to Mission Red Planet. However, instead of playing cards to fight for area control on the board, most if not all of Libertalia's gameplay only comprises of the card play itself. So no, there is no area control mechanic in Libertalia. In exchange though, Libertalia's card play is more intricate and has 40 different character cards as opposed to Mission Red Planet's puny 9. That being said, each game everyone will only see 18 cards which are progressively added over 3 rounds. Each player will get the same 6 cards each round and the set of 6 to be added will be chosen at random. Also, instead of activating everything when a card is revealed, Libertalia's card effects only activate when you reach specific stages of a round shown by one of the 4 icons. To understand this a bit more, here's a mini rundown of a round. Players begin the turn by secretly choosing a card from their hand. This will then be revealed simultaneously and arranged in ascending numerical order. All daytime effects will then be activated one at a time from left to right, followed by the dusk powers right after in reverse. Right before doing your character's dusk effect, you must take one loot tile from the pool available for that turn. Yes, these are the same ridiculously pretty tiles as Azul's. Aside from giving you constant urge to eat them, each different tile has their own unique effects and you can choose to either use their calm or stormy side or a mix of both. After taking the loot and doing the dusk effect, you then retrieve the card and add it into your crew in front of you. After all the other players have done the same actions, everyone will then activate all of their crew members night powers including the ones that they obtained from the previous turns. And all of that folks is basically one turn in Libertalia. After a set number of turns, you'll eventually reach the end of the round where you'll activate all of your crew members anchor abilities. Everyone then discards their entire crew but at the start of next round, you will get 6 additional new cards to start building your crew again. Now that we have some understanding of the two games, here's what I'll bluntly say. I like Mission Red Planet better in almost every possible way. As fancy as Libertalia's card play and variety sounds, it still pales in comparison to Mission Red Planet's area control. The mechanic adds this extra depth to the game and with it comes this huge decision space that Libertalia does not have. Also, Libertalia's cards can be quite conditional. It's usually pretty obvious which one should be played earlier or later in a round. Sometimes they also interact with other stuff such as your loot tokens or other crew members in your ship. As a result, you can get occasional turns where everyone plays the same card because it's clearly the best card to play at the time. Now I know that the loot tokens can shift the priorities a bit but this will likely still happen because both the cards that you get and the loot token pool that you choose from are randomized. This doesn't really happen in Mission Red Planet because their character cards are more versatile. Most of the character's effects can be fully used at any point during the game, meaning 
meaning you always have more choices on which one to pick. Lastly, I was thinking of recommending Libertalia as the simpler, more approachable alternative, but there really isn't a big leap of complexity between the two. Moreover, Mission Red Planet is noticeably more streamlined, despite it being marginally more complex. All in all, there definitely is a solid game in Libertalia, but I really can't find a reason to recommend it over Mission Red Planet. So yeah, hope you enjoyed this video. Check out my channel for more videos like this. They are usually not as long as this one. Anyways, that's it. See ya!